thank you very much, Peter, uh, for taking time out and talking to us. Uh, we are going to discuss a very important topic that is sustaining climate crisis, uh, especially when it has already happened to Pakistan. We have had uh, extremely uh, huge flood this year, and now we are going through the uh, aftermath of that uh, uh, climate-driven crisis. And uh, I guess this is about time that we think how anticipation, future li literacy helps us anticipate climate crisis and prepare for it. So if you could please uh, tell us a little bit about that. Of course. Um, most of us, uh, the, good, the good thing about what's happened in the last hundred years or so is that uh, more countries are allowing more participation uh, of their citizens, uh, various forms of democracy, various forms of citizenship. It is now uh, possible in many countries, and, and I believe Pakistan is one of them, that have a much more um, clear connection with what the citizens want to happen and what the government actually does. And that's, a, that's, a, that's a, something to celebrate. I hope I'm correct, and I hope you agree with me on that. Um, therefore, leaders uh, have actually two positions in any issue that's controversial. One position is to follow the values and the wishes of their constituents. So when their constituents say, we want this law or we want this change, then the leader, the political leader, whether it's in an assembly or in the administration and the government, uh, should listen to that and should do everything they can within their means to respond to those positively. On the other hand, sometimes leaders need to assert their own values because they believe, truly believe that they are better, uh, that the public may not be perfectly correct in their view. And so it's a tough job uh, being a politician, being a political leader in, in our world today. Uh, same I think is true of business leaders. Uh, most businesses are for-profit organizations and they have shareholders. And part of their responsibility is to return value for the investments that those shareholders have made uh, as much as, again, they can possibly do. Uh, it has not been quite so common these days as it was, say, 30 or 40 or 50 years ago. But even business leaders need to take their community and their nation into account. Not, it's not just pure profit but they should be uh, decent to their employees, uh, decent to their customers, follow the laws and rules of the, of the country when it comes to environmental regulation. So the climate crisis, unfortunately, is, um, is a function of the, of, well, you asked about the future's literacy. If the public is more educated about the future, knows how to think about the future more clearly and more directly, then they can guide both the political leadership and the business leadership to do those things that they want to see happen. Unfortunately, as you know, you have a, a course in future studies, which is marvelous. I'm so happy to hear that. On the other hand, that's not common in universities in the world uh, or even in secondary schools like middle schools and high schools. Uh, our young people do not hear about the future. And so it is my job in, in an organization that I created called Teach the Future to uh, educate and to introduce futures thinking to those schools. The idea is that when they understand the future, and of course, climate change, which is a reality in most people's world, would be part of that future, not the only part, but part of it. And as they understand that more, they would then activate themselves as citizens and as consumers and customers to influence the political and the business establishments to do something about it. Uh, but it is a complicated arrangement. Political leaders don't always listen to their constituents. Uh, they have other interests. Some of those constituents, unfortunately, have undue influence over their decisions because they make campaign contributions, they uh, allow them to use their facilities and in-kind contributions. And that's something that political leaders 
have to take into account. It's not against the law. Of course, it becomes if it becomes too much, then it becomes what we would call corruption or being bought by people with influence or money. Same way with business leaders, they have their shareholders to take into account. On the other hand, they should also be taking care of their community. So balancing those interests is not easy for those, for those people, but having a citizenry and a customer base that believes that climate change is an existential threat to our planet and to our civilization. Uh, and the floods in Pakistan are only the latest example of that. And unfortunately, they will not, not be the last example. We will have, we're having more frequent uh, environmental disruptions, more frequent climate disruptions throughout the world. Uh, my wife and I experienced one of those called uh, Hurricane Harvey in Houston, Texas in, 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 20, um, in 2017, just before we moved to California. It was, a hur it was a tropical storm, which should not have become a hurricane, uh, it, 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 but it grew very rapidly. And the reason it grew rapidly was because the waters outside of Houston and the Gulf of Mexico were warmer than they had been historically almost ever. So in a very short time, it blew up to be a hurricane and a very devastating one for the Texas coast. So we're all experiencing these climate crises. These are the kinds of things that one would study in a, in a future studies course. So we believe that, uh, that the futures literacy is a key to bringing everyone into what we, you and I know and your, your faculty know are some really interesting, but also some very delicate and difficult problems. Oh, when uh, uh, you, you, you are running a, uh, this organization, Teach the Future, and uh, you are teaching young people and you are including future literacy as part of their curriculum. How did you manage it? How did you manage to do, how did you manage to introduce future literacy and uh, uh, have the stakeholders convinced that this should be part of the curriculum? And is it just one chapter, few lessons, or a whole course that uh, you have prepared for uh, grade one to grade 12? Well, uh, I don't want to overstate our success. <laughs> I've been doing this um, on and off for about 12 or 13 years, officially for about eight years as, as, an, as a corporation. We still do not have very many colleges or schools who are including futures in there. So those few, that I have uh, convinced, or we have convinced, to put futures into their curriculum are responding to a message in which I might say, I present them with the, a question uh, that almost every college, almost every school in the world teaches about the past. In fact, it's almost required for teachers to learn something from the past, not just history, but science, literature, uh, politics, government, everything they teach is pushing the, is, is transmitting the knowledge and the experience of the past to the young students, which is a fine mission. Unfortunately, there is an assumption there that knowledge of from the past will equip young people to deal with the future. That assumption is not wrong, and it's correct in a lot of ways. I'm a great student of history, having become a futurist. And so I think of human civilization and human society as a three-act play. The first act is the past, of course, things that have happened. We learn about those. We study them. We try and understand ourselves and our, our, our species and our civilization from what we have been through in the past. The present is the second act. That's covered largely by journalism and media. So we are in touch with events more so than ever before immediately. I mean, it would have taken 100 years, it would have taken months, if not years, to learn about the floods in Pakistan and the United States, and, and, and it was on the news within 10 minutes. So uh, we, have that, we have that capability. What we don't have is an institution which is dedicated to sharing information and ideas and perspectives about the future. 
So three acts, act one, act two, act three. So education does act one very well, unfortunately, almost exclusively. Journalism and media do act two very well. Now I'm all mixed up with a lot of uh, misinformation and things like that, but it still is covering the current events. No institution in society, whether it's schools or government or businesses, take the responsibility for introducing sophisticated and useful and effective futures thinking to the population as a whole. Uh, so I present that to educators and I say, why aren't you doing this? I really think, indeed, 100 years from now, the question that historians may ask about our time, about our era, why didn't they teach them about the future? What were they, what were they afraid of? What, what were they holding back? Uh, if it had been 50 years ago, the educator could make an argument, well, we don't know how to do that. Well, that argument is not true anymore. We do know how to think about the future, prepare for the future, and indeed influence the future. And we're doing it in universities such as yours, I did it for 30 years in Houston, developing uh, and, and, and supporting people who became professional futurists and foresight professionals. We know how to prepare them for that. And it's the same concepts. It's not the same level of detail. It's not the same level of, of uh, competence, but everyone should know uh, a little bit about how to think about the future and how to prepare for the future. So the argument that we don't know how to do it uh, is not true anymore. We do know how to do it. But getting uh, a new subject into education today, and has always been difficult, it's not impossible. Uh, uh, universities, your university, I'm sure, is teaching computer science now and coding and, and microelectronics. It's probably teaching biotechnology and all kinds of uh, biological subjects that you never would have covered. So these are subjects that have come along since you and I were young people in school. So education does pick up subjects once in a while. What they don't uh, do, however, is that they wait for someone to produce or for society to produce something I call a demand signal, very much like a business. We're not gonna produce a product for which we don't believe people will buy it. And at the end of the day, even though colleges and universities and schools are nonprofit organizations, they still are in a business of sorts, which is offering teaching and learning on a subject that people will take. And indeed, governments will pay for it and individuals will pay for it in their tuition. So we can't introduce a subject for which there's not a lot. So it's kind of, we call it the chicken and the egg problem. So which came first, the chicken and laid the eggs? Or did the egg come first and the chicken came out of it? So we don't have a public right now which believes, and, or, and let's say even parents, who believe that learning about the future is something that is important enough for them to influence their schools, indeed the schools their children are going to, the teachers the teacher who are teaching their very children. We don't have a constituency, a big enough constituency yet to get the school's attention to say, no, we should be doing this because the parents, the business community, the political community wants a citizenry, wants customers, and wants individuals who are prepared to deal with an uncertain and, and, and turbulent future. Uh, when that demand signal becomes stronger, then education will pick it up and they will start responding. Will you also uh, have uh, worked with the undergrad program in Futures Studies, master's program, and PhD programs. Uh, your, uh, your Houston University is probably one of the, uh, the uh, uh, pioneers of Futures Studies in that sense. Uh, when your student graduates from uh, undergrad program in Futures Studies or master's program or PhD program, do they find jobs? Do, th do we have occupations or titles as futurists in corporations, in uh, governments, and NGOs? I would say uh, when, when students came, I wanted to be honest. Uh, a lot of times um, university programs will produce more graduates than the market can stand because there is no limit 
uh, to what the university can provide. And in fact, they get paid for every student who enrolls in the courses and in the degrees. So there's an incentive to have as many students and as many graduates as possible. On the other hand, when students said, can I ask me exactly the same question, can I get a job? I say it is a, a it is a, what I call a high risk degree. Uh, it's not like an MBA. It's not like an engineering degree or a degree in sales or business, small business management. It's a degree which is unusual. There are not uh, as many jobs as there are for most occupations. And then, but I then say it is also a degree that is almost universally valid. Whatever you do, whether you become a professional futurist or not, uh, you can apply these skills to a whole range of different occupations. Uh, uh, critical thinking, research, the use of judgment, collaboration and teamwork, uh, presentation and communication. These are universal skills, whether you're in business or government or in, in, in some kind of technical professional field. And, 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 they, and they like that. So it's a universal kind. It's not like engineering, where if you get an engineering degree, you're pretty well locked into being in some kind of a technical occupation. It's hard to take that into education. It's hard to take that into even most businesses. Uh, but future studies is a kind of a universal degree and you can use it in very many places. So yes, uh, now we have uh, associations in the futures world. Um, the one that was created, the, the elderly organization is called the World Future Studies Federation. It was founded in Paris in 1971. It is still a very vibrant organization. It tends to be largely academics. Uh, and intellectuals, people who write books and give speeches on the future. Um, in 2002, we created another organization called the Association of Professional Futurists, more oriented towards the career professional, less the academic, people who are actually earning a living doing, uh, doing future studies and offering that to the marketplace. There are somewhere between four and 500 people around the world who are members of the APF, the Association of Professional Futurists. At last time I looked, there were about 300 people as members of the Federation. Uh, there are, um, for instance, in, um, in Canada, where I completed a long series of uh, certificate courses, very short courses for adults in the Canadian government, we, uh, we educated something like four or 500 uh, Canadian, most of them government employees on how to think about the future, how to use the future in their work. And this was throughout. Now they were not professional futurists, but they had been assigned a task, whether they were in health or, or climate, environment studies, whether they were in employment or banking, they were sent to our course to learn how to deal with the future, a form of futures literacy. They're not professional futurists, but uh, we had over a hundred organizations in Canada sent people to that course because they said, we have to learn how to deal with the future. They also have a centralized foresight unit called Policy Horizons Canada, which reports to a very high level committee of civil servants, deputy ministers, and they do the internal studies for the parliament, for the, for the administration, for the government. Uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm gratified that we were able to educate so many of their civil servants. So yes, there is a future to working in future studies. It's not as easy and not as plentiful as business or engin engineering or education, uh, but it is growing. And we believe that people who join us, a lot of people said, well, I really thought I would get an MBA, but this is a lot more interesting. <laughs> and we have that one thing. It is, it, you're on the cutting edge of change. You're not just doing something, accounting or finance, just uh, basically working for a business. Future studies is always about change. So you're always on the edge of change. For instance, the, you know, the, uh, the climate crisis and, and the COP27 and all of that, we're intensely interested and involved we had futurists there uh, in, in Egypt at the, uh, at the latest uh, COP meeting. And um, it's, uh, it's gratifying to see this field grow. So small, yes, but growing also, yes. Uh, do you think we need to have an interdisciplinary 
multidisciplinary approach uh, in teaching future studies? Uh, is it important for us to look at the future from multiple perspective? Uh, is, it, is it necessary to have uh, that kind of approach to future studies teaching? Future studies, frankly, is already interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary by its very nature. Uh, we're not the people who do the narrow economic studies or the narrow military studies. We're people who, uh, in, the, in the general sense, in the futures literacy sense, we use all of the material that those experts and, and those specialists provide us, and we put it together in a gigantically uh, complicated package of, so we have to cover all the disciplines. And I would say that we should be teaching the future in school in all the disciplines. So futures is not uh, old enough yet to have created a silo. I don't know if you understand that term, a place where we're teaching the future and you're not allowed to. No, we would like to be in every class. Every science class should be talking about the future of the science that they're studying. History should be able to apply the lessons of the past to the future. How is this like? How is this different than the way it used to be? We should, and there's a term that is that I borrow from another field, which is uh, language and writing and communication. In the United States, at least, there was a movement called writing across the curriculum. So every subject should have some writing in it. Uh, obviously history, obviously literature, but science should have some writing in it, writing lab reports, even math, writing out how you figure that out. What is the problem? Not just the equations, but the language associated with mathematical thinking. Uh, we should have futures across the curriculum. Every subject should be uh, should study the past, which most of them don't. I wish they did. Uh, and every and should study the present and the current issues and the current situation we are in 2022. And every subject ought to have a futures component to it. So I, it is most subjects I, I, I say are inherently multidisciplinary, but the way we have developed universities, particularly today, is that in order to be narrow, it has been necessary to create disciplines to really go into depth and very detailed and concrete things. And that's marvelous. I'm glad people are doing that. What the university doesn't do as well is put all that together into a story, into a picture of the world, humans in the world. And, and so we don't do, uh, I know we're very familiar with a process we teach in the university called analysis, which is taking things apart from the Greek. Uh, what we don't do is synthesis. Synth is, in Greek is with. So putting things back together again. So we've taken the radio apart or the automobile apart, and we're good at that. But we don't know really well how to put it back together. We don't know how to put together a picture of ourselves as a human species in, a, in an era, in a time, uh, as, a, a, as a consumable product. Everything is segmented into small little pieces. And that's unfortunate. And so what futures do is put all those pieces together. I use the image of a tapestry. We take the blue threads and the red threads and the black threads, and we weave a picture. Now, that picture may not be totally accurate, may not be scientifically provable, but it is suggestive of a world that we live in that we should be talking about and discussing. Uh, when we talk about futures literacy or futures studies, uh, how important is values, especially ethics? Uh, how's that part of uh, futures studies teaching? And uh, uh, yes, yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, no, absolutely important. When I start talk, I begin uh, in my teaching not, not so much with the future. That's down the road. I start talking about change, change over time, social change, change in society, change in organization. I have to say that, that, and I've shared this with historian friends of mine, I don't think history does a very good job of talking about change. They do a very good job talking about difference. So 100 years ago, this is the way it was, and this is the way it is today, if they ever get to today. 200 years ago was this, 500 years ago was this. So we do see that societies have had different forms, different shapes. We do learn a lot from that but they really don't tell the story of change over time. 
And that's one thing that, that I try and do this three act play. We begin in the past through the present and into the future. So uh, the first thing I teach about change is that there are two major sources of change. Where does change come from? The first is the world, the world we live in. And I hurry on to say that most of the big things going on in the world, we have little, if any, influence over. It's very much like sitting down at a, at a card table, if you play cards, and uh, you, you get a hand, you know, if you play poker or whatever. Uh, you get a hand. You can't say, oh, I don't like that hand. I want another one. No, no, you have to play the hand that you, so that's the in, what we call inbound change. That's the change that the world is doing and impacting our lives. A huge, I mean, the floods example, talk about inbound change. You and, and, and the Pakistani community had very little to say about those floods and very little influence over them. On the other hand, we are not purely victims of those changes. We do have time and talent and resources to influence the future to the extent that we can. And therefore we call that outbound change. Now, which are the outbound changes that we want to, to influence and head towards? That's a function of values. What are my values? What, are, what is the society that I would like to be part of? And, what, what, and part of that is, I basically believe ethics is how we conduct ourselves with respect to other people and how will we show them respect? Will we allow them to have freedom and, and expression? Uh, all of that. So values are extremely important. Most people think of the future as determined and values don't play a role so much in that because the world will have its way. It, it, it creates the changes that we have to deal with. But we also have a say. We're also at the table. And, and about climate change, this is where the futures literacy comes in because I think if we have a population that is, let's call it futures literate, whatever that means, we could talk about what all that means, then they will be able to influence the government and the business and the civil society to, to move more rapidly to try and solve this problem or mitigate this problem in the future. So uh, values are extremely important, yes. Uh, talking about climate-driven uh, change and climate crisis that we have seen in Pakistan and in Nigeria this year, and uh, we are anticipating more of such calamities happening uh, in uh, other countries too. So the question is that that was raised in COP27 as well was of climate justice, uh, and that is also a moral question. And that is also a question uh, uh, that relates to uh, survival of the uh, humanity as such, maybe our planet as well. So when we talk about COP27, what we have seen is a resolution saying that uh, they, uh, they, the developed countries will uh, create a fund to help out the vulnerable countries, the ones which are a victim of this climate driven change where their participation of carbon footprint was very little as compared to the, to the participation or contribution of the Western countries, which has benefited because of it. And through that, they have industrialized themselves. On the other hand, uh, we have Pakistan, which has only less than 1% of carbon emission. And uh, we, uh, we are facing this climate change in order to uh, to, to make our life better, to make us prosperous, we need to work on economic growth. And once again, in that cycle, our contribution of a carbon footprint will increase. So how, how do you deal with these kind of dilemmas? And what is your anticipation? When do you, would you see this climate justice plan will take into effect? Um no expert on climate change. I think I told you that when I when I agreed to this interview. So I'm not. I only read um, know what I read in in, in news in news media. Uh, and there was a, an extensive report on COP27 that I did read. The the conclusion from this report, which I take to be valid, is that yes, that fund has been created. I think it was actually created in COP26 or 2025. But uh, it has not been very much, very well funded. There was supposed to be a billion dollars in it every year from developed countries. 
And I think one year they got, uh, no, it was supposed to be 100 million injected every year. And one year they got 85 million, but never 100. So the fund is there, the mechanism is there, uh, but the funding is not. Uh, how does how do I deal with it? Well, I'm a student of change, so I don't deal with it particularly. My job is to try and educate people on these realities. I have no political influence outside that. And yet in the long run, and this is a very long game, I believe if we include these subjects in school, that when these young people grow up, whether they're college students or high school students, they will understand the situation better. And in a democracy, which we hope continues, they will then make their voice heard. Right now, the leaders who are not contributing to that fund are also under pressure from a constituency, from a voting population, frankly, and I hate to say this, that don't want them to do that. They want their money for themselves, which sounds selfish, okay, or self-interested, yes. Look, we have problems here at home. We have, we have issues of, of uh, unemployment. We have issues of pollution. We have issues of crime. We have issues of inflation. Why are you going off to Egypt and giving our money away to those people? Uh, and why should our money go that way? Now, I don't support that position. Unfortunately, in most countries, most developed countries of the world, I think that's a majority position. So politicians who are political leaders elected to do the will of the people, if the people say, we don't, want to, we don't want you to do that, or we only want you to do that a tiny little bit, then uh, if you go against that a lot, all the time, you're not in that position very long. And somebody else will come in that position who will uh, do what, what the people want. So it, it has to be a grassroots operation. It has to be a grassroots movement that says, we are the people, we are the ones who influence you. We want you to do this. And frankly, it, 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 a tiny little bit at a time, I would like to say that I see the signs of that, both from a public point of view, these uh, terrible events that occur naturally, and the droughts that we're having in California, for instance, and, and throughout, throughout the world, um, are sending a message to people. Now, People who uh, are in trouble oftentimes don't want to admit they're in trouble. They may be overweight, they may have high blood pressure, uh, they may be addicted to some substance like alcohol or drugs or something like that. And they know it, <laughs> you know, they're not, they're not asleep. But making the change is really, really hard. And this change is as difficult as is possible, because if we look around, we have essentially backed ourselves into a corner. We have to literally tear the primary energy source of modern society out of it, tear it out at the roots and substitute something else, either behavior change or renewable technologies and things like that. So even though our values say we should do that, it is not an easy thing to do. And it is technically difficult, it is financially difficult, and it's politically difficult. So uh, are we moving fast enough? In my estimation, of course not. Are we moving a little bit? I do believe that there is now more attention than there was 20 or 30 years ago, as just as with futures literacy. The few schools that are teaching it, yours included, are doing a great job of bringing the citizens to know their own future which is not something schools have ever done and most schools are still not doing it. But I have to be optimistic, else I wouldn't be in this business. I have to think the little bit of improvement that we're having is better than nothing. And so, yes, um, the only way to deal with it is to say one step at a time, let's keep pushing and let's keep influencing. And in our case, influencing young people to know these issues, and to influence what they can, influence their school to teach more futures, influence their parents to vote for people who are taking this issue seriously, influencing their communities by uh, protesting or working in a nonprofit. Uh, we, so empowerment and action are a very much a part of future studies. It's not just sitting back and watching a movie 
not watching uh, the world come to an end. It is also doing something about it. Both of those things are extremely important. And of course, uh, we want young people to have their voice heard and, and be part of the solution. Uh, this brings me to the last question that I have. It's about the role and function of uh, imagination in futures literacy and anticipation. Uh, would you please elaborate or explain that a little bit? I have to begin with the present and the history of uh, the university. Um, ever since the last two or 300 years and is now developed to the point where knowledge is considered to be based upon science, based upon evidence, and based upon a consensus of experts. Um, that's a wonderful movement. It's better than it being up to uh, certain people to say what is true and what's not true. We all have an agreement. We should pursue a scientific and a professional approach. And that's just not true in science. That's true in business. It's true in government. Policy uh, analysis is based upon that. Let's get evidence for whether this program or this policy will make people's lives better. We use an evidence-based approach. What we leave out, and again, that's not wrong, but it's incomplete. We leave out the fact that it is that excellent policy and excellent business and excellent science even is a product of imagination. I mean, a figure no less noteworthy than Albert Einstein began thinking about the laws of relativity when he imagined himself riding on a beam of light traveling at the speed of light. I don't understand that particularly, but he used his imagination. Scientists are using their imagination all the time. Business people are using their imagination all the time. And yet, is that ever covered in school? Are students allowed to imagine in school? Oh, no, no, you have to have facts. You have to have data. You have to have evidence. You can't think about something that could be you only can think about something that will be because you have the data to say so. And in that sense, that's a shame because the human activity, what we have done is taken a good thing, which is evidence-based knowledge and science, fundamentally, scientific approach. And we've, it, we've extrapolated it and we've used it too much to exclude the fact that our imagination is also a human capacity and the human capacity to imagine all different futures and alternative futures is one of the things and to imagine a preferred future a better future is absolutely part of our human existence but we don't teach that in school and definitely we should so i think your your logo there which says i see on the screen says imagine <laughs> obviously it's a big thing for you I just uh, was at a conference in Phoenix, Arizona, uh, a wonderful university, which I'm sure you're familiar with, Arizona State University. Yeah. They have a College of Global Futures. They have program uh, uh, degrees in sustainability, degrees in innovation. And the woman I work with there works for the Center of Science and the Imagination. And I understood their, their, uh, their process uh, more because because I was there. They really do believe that imagination is a constituent player. It is a human capacity that we should harness along with evidence for knowing about the future and for imagining what the future could be, both of its positive ways, negative ways, and preferred ways. We should uh, have that as well. So I'm fully supporting your efforts. If you're pushing imagination in school, go for it. I hope you're successful. We are too. Thank you so much, Peter. Your, your talk was wonderful. It is, it is enlightening for me, and I hope that my audience will also uh, enjoy it and they will learn from it. And maybe we can start this movement of future literacy in Pakistan and other places to create a sustainable society. I appreciate your time. Thank you so much.